Well, it's good to be here. And it is true that if you buy one of those books, on a, you can use it on a cool summer evening and use it as a doorstop. Um, one person was carrying it through the airport. I saw them and said that it's helping uh, him exercise. And uh, other times, if you read it late at night, it will put you to sleep. So there are other reasons for these, these books. The title for our message tonight is uh, the Old Testament is a key to understanding the book of Revelation. Now, there's no way that I can talk on that in a timely way. And so, of course, I'm going to have to choose a sliver of that. And so I'm going to tweak that just a little bit. I'm going to talk about uh, the Old Testament and the purpose of symbolism in the book of Revelation. But uh, before I do, just a few comments on, on, on the broad use of the Old Testament. In the book of Revelation, almost in every verse, there's one allusion, often two or three, maybe four allusions. And it is saturated, it has more Old Testament in it than any other New Testament book, and yet it has less formal quotations. Uh, and the reason that for that is, uh, uh, in every verse, you're getting three or four verses from the Old Testament. Well, you can't quote all of them if you're going to put them in a verse. You have to allude to them. Daniel, of course, is one of the great books in the book of Revelation. And, of course, that would tell us Revelation is going to be about, be about believers in exile, as Daniel and his friends, uh, about eventually how believers will be exalted, as was true of Daniel and his friends, but ultimately how God's people will suffer uh, in the future and how they will uh, uh, reign with uh, the Messiah and the Son of Man in the future. Ezekiel uh, used so much. And uh, one of the reasons for, for both Ezekiel and Daniel and its use is because uh, those books recapitulate themselves. That is, uh, they, uh, the same chapter will go over the, the same topic of the preceding chapter. How many times can Ezekiel talk about Israel sinning and going into exile and going to be restored again? Uh, my colleague, former colleague at Gordon-Conwell, uh, Doug Stewart uh, said he almost had to virtually consult a thesaurus so he could use different wording as he was writing a commentary on, on Ezekiel. It recapitulates itself. And so does John's book recapitulate itself. There's so much I could say here, but I think we need to uh, uh, cut to the particular uh, aspect that I want to address tonight. I want to try to talk about um, how do we interpret the book of Revelation. And I'm going to do that. Uh, by talking about the purpose of symbolism in the book of Revelation. Now, many of us have heard the statement that's almost a proverb, uh, whether in churches, businesses, or, or homes, and it's this, we've done it for so long, why change it now? And the proverbial saying expresses something about our human nature that we do not like to change. And when something goes on for a long enough time, we get used to it, we often get so used to it that it really is uncomfortable to change. And if it's something bad, to which we become accustomed, well, that also we tend not to want to change. Many of us who are parents have to do radical things, get very creative about the bad behavior patterns uh, of our children when they're young or when they were young. Uh, and uh, sometimes they'll get into habit patterns and, 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 and we have to jolt them out of that. Um, many of us have heard in the news at various points, at some point, uh, how teenagers or young people come under the influence of cults and uh, virtually get brainwashed. And then the parents will hire someone to go get them out of the cult and re-brainwash them and, and use some radical creative methods for that. Uh, we've heard about uh, massive earthquakes, tsunamis. Uh, we have Frankenstorm that's coming, apparently, uh, up the coast that they're calling, Sa Hurricane Sandy. Uh, when these things have happened in the past, we, we s hear about them. I remember hearing about the tsunami, this massive tsunami that occurred a few years ago. I was on the way to the airport, and I thought, oh, that sounds pretty bad. Then I saw pictures of it, and it impressed me in a much different way, and I'm sure many uh, Americans having heard it and then seen the pictures were more motivated to send support to that part of the world. Point is that we are people who need something radical to get our attention to change 
what we're lackadaisical about or we have a bad habit about. Um, now, if this is true on the mundane, everyday level, how much more true is it on the spiritual level? We are people who get accustomed to our sinful habit patterns, and the genius of sin is that uh, we, we either rationalize it away, we don't think it's too bad, and, 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 and we get into a habit pattern of it. Uh, this evening we want to ask what radical actions God takes to get our attention so that we'll see the seriousness of our sinful ways and take action and change. Now, the book of Revelation is a good place to see what radical way God gets our attention on these matters. How does God communicate to his people in this book? Now, one popular approach to the book of Revelation is to try to understand uh, the majority of the book literally as much as possible. And when this appears not to work, then, okay, you can interpret the book symbolically. And the, 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 this hermeneutical approach, this interpretative approach is often put this way. Interpret literally unless you're forced to interpret figuratively. Otherwise, you're going to start allegorizing and reading wild things into the book. Now, I want to investigate uh, and, and think about that uh, particular programmatic approach. Interpret literally unless you're forced to interpret figuratively. And I want to do it by turning to Revelation 1 and verse 1. I'd like you, if you have your Bibles, to turn there. And we will be looking at various passages this evening in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 1. This is the programmatic verse for the book. It's, the it's where we get the title of the book. Revelation 1.1, 1, 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show to his servants the things which must shortly take place. And he sent and communicated it by his angel to his bond servant, John. Now, that last phrase in verse 1, which in my Bible says, and communicated it by his angel to his bond servant, John. It's the Greek word uh, semino, and the pronunciation doesn't mean that much, but the English translations render that and translate it differently. Some say communicated, like my New American Standard. Some say made known, like the RSV and the King James, uh, sorry, the NIV and others. Some say signified, like the King James, and some say made clear. Um, well, which is it? The, this, this Greek word elsewhere in the New Testament and in the Greek world outside of the New Testament can have any of these ranges of meaning. They are possible ways to interpret the book. But if you take the translation in a general way, if you just say made known or communicated or made clear, then it's possible to hold that approach that says interpret literally unless you're forced to interpret figuratively because it's just a general statement here, isn't it, that the book of Revelation was communicated. Well, you have to decide how was it communicated and uh, uh, the popular approach in many of our churches is it was communicated literally. However, I mentioned that the King James um, translates this as signified. My New American Standard Bible has the marginal reading of signify. And the idea is communicate by symbols. Now, if that's the meaning of this word, then that's different, isn't it? That's specifying the communication. It's not just a general making known uh, or communicating so that you could say, yeah, most of it's literal. If this is signify or communicate by symbolism, this is very specific. It's the programmatic verse here is saying this book is predominantly a communication by symbols. In fact, the noun form of this word uh, that we're talking about here, that last phrase, uh, communicated it by his uh, uh, angel to his bondservant John, which, which I think is probably best translated, he signified it by his angel to his bondservant, John. Uh, that same word, the noun form of that word, is the word used in the Gospels. Uh, for Jesus' signs when he did a miracle. And why? Because his miracles symbolized, they pointed to his uh, redeeming work. So in Mark 2, when he heals a lame man, it indicated his ability to heal spiritually. And uh, he says so there. So uh, this word then, I think, probably has the notion 
of communicate by symbols. But why? Why would I choose that particular translation at this point over the others? Because verse 1, and here we come to the Old Testament. Some of you might have a, marginal, uh, a margin in your Bible that'll have verses out by verse 1. And you'll notice that uh, Daniel 2, 28 and following is among those verses. Uh, some of you will have that. Just curious, how many of you have that? Just curious, maybe you don't have a Bible with margins, but I see some people uh, do have that. Um, well, so what difference does that make? Well, I think it's an allusion to Daniel. What's an allusion to Daniel? The unique combination in this verse, read with me now, revelation, apocalypsis in Greek, that comes from Daniel 2. Also, the phrase show comes from Daniel 2, 28 and following. And then that phrase, things which must come to pass. That comes from Daniel. And guess what? Our word for communicate, which it's debated, is this general communication or symbolism? That word is found in Daniel. These combinations are unique to Daniel chapter 2. Now, if my wife were here tonight, she would be raising her hand in the back to remind me, and, and if she could say it, she would. If she wouldn't be too embarrassed, she'd say, well, what difference does that make? So, okay, Daniel 2, big deal. Well, we got to rehearse now. And this is the point about how the Old Testament relates to the book of Revelation. You've got to do this in every case. You've got to go back to the context. And what's the context of Daniel 2? Well, most of this comes from Daniel 2, 28 and 45, where, remember, Nebuchadnezzar's had a dream. And he sees a big statue in four sections, a head of gold, uh, uh, and then a, uh, a, a second, third, and a fourth section. Each section represented a world kingdom. The first, Babylon, as uh, Daniel will go on to interpret it. The second is uh, Medo persia the, la the third, Greece, and then the fourth, probably the Roman Empire. Um, well, so what? Again, what difference does that make? Well, Nebuchadnezzar did not know the interpretation of his dream. He just had the dream. He didn't know what it was about. And so he tells his uh, wise men, if you can't interpret the dream, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to execute you. And uh, Daniel was among them as a wise man. And so um, uh, they said to him, uh, his wise men, well, tell us the dream and we'll interpret it. He says, no, no, no. If you really know your stuff, if you really are soothsayers, you can give me the content and the interpretation. Daniel himself then prays. God gives him the content of the dream and the interpretation. And so he says in Daniel 2.28, O king, God has showed to you what must come to pass in the latter days. And uh, likewise, he says, he's revealed it to you. The word, the noun form, ap apocalypse, apocalypsis, which is our word revelation. He's revealed it. And then in chapter 2, verse 45, he repeats it. O king, God has signified to you what has come to pass. He uses this particular word. So if we're going to let the context of Daniel be influential for verse 1 here in chapter 1, did the king see a vision that corresponded in a one-to-one -one way with historical reality? In other words, did that image that he saw, was it kind of like a big Godzilla? And was this image going to literally walk through the kingdoms of the world? No. It's like Russia's a bear. And Republicans are elephants. Democrats are donkeys. These are not literal uh, equivalents. And so if we understand that that vision was symbolic, Daniel has to interpret the sections as representing different nations. And so what's going on? John is starting out telling us, you know what? That vision that was symbolic, uh, that revelation that was symbolic for Nebuchadnezzar that Daniel interpreted, it's symbolic. This book is predominantly going to be a symbolic book. In fact, read verse 1 with me again. The revelation which Jesus Christ gave to him to show to his servants the things which must shortly take place. That word show, everywhere that word in Greek occurs in the book of Revelation, which is in 4.1, 17.1, 21.9, and 22.1, every time it introduces something symbolic. 
In chapter 17, for example, it introduces a whore called Babylon the Great riding on a scarlet beast. That is not literal. In chapter 21, 9 and 10, it introduces a city in the shape of a cubic holy of holies. That's not literal. In fact, whenever uh, uh, John in, in, indeed uh, uh, talks later in the book about different things, it's important to come back to this verse and to see how it might uh, bear on what John is talking about. So now in this like this popular approach that I talked about, interpret the book of Revelation literally, unless you're forced to interpret symbolically, I think we have to say, turn that on its head. Interpret the book figuratively, unless you're forced to interpret it literally. Now, one time a student came up to me after I was giving a lecture on this, and he said, in my church, if you don't take the book of Revelation literally, then you're a liberal, and because you're not taking Scripture seriously. And I said, because I take verse 1 literally, that it's saying the book is going to be symbolic, I take the book symbolically. <laughs> so if the main mode of communication in Revelation is that of symbolism, how should we interpret the symbols? But let me just stop for a moment. That's pretty much my approach. You go back, something's debated in the book of Revelation. If there's an Old Testament reference, you go back, you find out what it means, and then you bring that meaning over into the New Testament. And often, you'll get some clarity. I think in this case, we get some clarity, and I think it's important clarity at that point. Now, because something symbolic doesn't mean it ha doesn't have a literal reality, we're going to see there are plenty of symbolic things, but there are very literal realities behind that symbolism. So if the main mode of communication in Revelation is that of symbolism, how should we interpret the symbols? Now, some are defined for us, so that's easy. Unfortunately, most are. Not, they're not defined, and so the commentaries are bigger. If they were all defined, the commentaries would be much smaller. Um, but for example, seven stars in chapter 1. Uh, is explicitly said to be seven angels. The seven lampstands are seven churches of Asia Minor. The seven spirits of God uh, in chapter um, 1 is the Holy Spirit and the fullness of the Holy Spirit. We can go on and on, but there aren't a lot of those. Most of the time, the symbols are just used and they're not clearly, explicitly, formally interpreted. So what do you do? Most of the time, the symbols come from the Old Testament. And so you go to the Old Testament context. And often that context will help you, as I believe it has in uh, chapter 1 and in verse 1. All the numbers are symbolic, for example, against their Old Testament background. Seven, the number of completeness, the seven days of creation, for example. And so we have the completeness of judgments in the seals and the bowls and the trumpets, of which there are seven each. So the main mode of communication and revelation is that of symbolism. Yes, there's literal material in it, of course, but predominantly one should expect symbolism. So we should interpret revelation then primarily in a symbolic fashion, uh, not primarily in a literal fashion. But now we, we come to a very important question. Why use symbolism so predominantly in this book more than any of the other books? Uh, there, there's plenty of symbolism in the other books, as we're going to see Jesus and the prophets themselves spoke in, in uh, symbolic parallel par parables. But why does John do this so much more intensely and consistently in the book of Revelation? Well, no doubt, I mean, we can come up with some pretty quick reasons. Number one, he saw visions that were bizarre. He, he really uh, had a tough time uh, explaining them. What better way to explain them than to use some of the wording of the Old Testament? Wording, in fact, that related to those very visions that he saw. So we could say that the Old Testament is very important here, uh, so that this shows continuity with the Old Testament at that point. Certainly, we could say that uh, the diligent reader of God's Word is forced to really work diligently in, in interpreting the book of Revelation. If you don't do that, you will not have as deep and rich of an understanding of the book. But the main way to understand why there's so much symbolism in Revelation is to understand that John is a prophet like Jesus and the Old Testament prophets. 
To understand the way John communicates as a prophet, we've got to understand how the Old Testament prophets communicated and how Jesus, as the prophet par excellence, communicated. So, how do they communicate? Well, the next section of uh, this message this evening is titled, The Old Testament Prophets and Jesus Predominantly Use Symbolism Only in Response to One Particular Situation. When did the prophets primarily use symbolism? The prophets living toward the end of Israel's history had the primary role of warning Israel to repent or soon they would be judged. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, for example. Indeed, by the time of their ministries, their message was that judgment was coming, but in some way you could be delivered from it if you repented. They delivered their warnings in a very rational and sermonic manner, convicting their audience of self-serving moral permissiveness, recalling to them the lessons of their own history, how Israel had sinned in the past, and setting them up as an example, don't do this again. But this didn't change the Israelites. They'd become anesthetized. They, they were under a spiritual anesthesia because of their habitual avoidance to change their comfortable, sinful lifestyle. Their hearts had become hardened to rational, historical, and sermonic warning methods. So the prophet took up, took up other forms of warning than this direct way. They used symbolic action, parables, and words. But such a change in warning form is effective, however, as you read through the prophets, it's only effective with a faithful remnant. Those who have ears to hear and hear not, and have become hard-hearted, Symbolic language in parables only causes them to misunderstand further. When the prophets used symbolic parables, it was a sign that judgment was in the process of coming upon Israel. It was like raising a flag. It was a point to make that the majority of Israel is hardened, they're not going to listen anymore, and parables actually were a sign that judgment was on the way. So for hardened unbelievers, the literary form of parable appears whenever ordinary warnings are not heeded. No warning will ever be heeded by those so far disobeying. But the, these parables do shock the faithful remnant back into the reality of their faith. Now, Isaiah 6 is an important passage to look at. And I want to look at that for a moment if you turn to Isaiah 6, if you have your Bibles. In Isaiah 6, and in verse... Eight, Isaiah is given a very interesting commission. The Lord says in Isaiah 6 and verse 8, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. And here's what God told him. Verse 9 of Isaiah 6. He said, Go and tell this people, keep on listening, but do not perceive. Keep on looking, but do not understand. By the way, that phrase, do not perceive, in Hebrew is a command. It's a, it's, it, it has what we call a justice force, a commanding force. So also keep on looking, but do not understand. Can you imagine? This is tough. Can you imagine teaching a Sunday school and say, here's my message, but I don't want you to perceive it. In fact, I'm commanding you not to perceive it. It's a pretty tough passage. Verse 10, make the hearts of this people insensitive, that is by your preaching. Their ears dull, their eyes dim, lest they see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and repent and be healed. Well, I can say much more about this passage, but I'm, I'm going to cut it short here. I've got about 40 pages of it in my, we become what we worship. But here, all we need to know is, why, why are, there, are they said they have ears, but they can't hear, eyes, but they can't see? Why? Well, it becomes evident that uh, as you let Scripture interpret Scripture, Psalm 115, 135 says, the idols of the nations have eyes. Uh, but they can't see. They have ears, but they can't hear. And it goes on and it says, those who make them will become like them, even those who worship them. This is a judgment here. Why? It's not willy-nilly, oh, I'm going to harden Israel through Isaiah. No. After years and years and years of idol worship, they hadn't listened. They were intractable in their idol worship. And so God says, I'm going to judge you. As in Romans 1, he gives them over to further sin because of their sin. Here, he says, you like idols? that have eyes but can't see and ears but can't hear, you're going to become just like those idols. 
You've begun to be anesthetized. You're going to become even more anesthetized. Well, then what happens? It's not by accident that in this passage, when Israel is seen to be under the judgment of idolatrous anesthesia, spiritual anesthesia, they get parables. Where are the parables? Look at chapter 7 and verse 3. The Lord said to Isaiah, go out now to meet Ahaz, you and your son, Shear our Jashub. That means a remnant will return. So what? Okay. We got a little walking parable here in a child. And so whenever a remnant will return uh, is out late and, and he should be home, his mom says, little remnant will return, come home. And some people say, Isaiah, always naming his kids, these weird names. And yeah, that's really stupid. That's what the majority might have said probably. But you know, a faithful remnant might have said, hmm, you know, Isaiah's a prophet. There's a reason maybe he named the kid that way. The idea would be he's a walking parable that Israel's going to go into exile and come back. In chapter 8, 3 uh, of Isaiah, he names his child uh, swift as the booty and speedy as the prey. Why would he do that? Again, whenever little swift as the booty, speedy as the prey is late, his mother says, swift as the booty, speedy as the prey, come home. And again, same, uh, weird, this is weird that Isaiah would name his kid that. No, this is what's going to happen to Israel. A walking parable that child is. And chapter 8 and verse 18 of Isaiah says this about those, child's na those children's names. Behold, I and the children whom the Lord has given me are for signs and wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts who dwells on Mount Zion. And it's clear they're signs and wonders as a sign of judgment. In fact, later on in um, Isaiah 29, um, actually Isaiah 20, Isaiah walks naked on, bare, on, on his bare feet for three years before the eyes of Israelite onlookers. Why? Because they had sought refuge in Egypt and Ethiopia, and he was a walking parable saying, this is what's going to happen to Egypt and Ethiopia, and you've sought refuge in them, you're going to follow them, and you're going to look like people in exile. In Ezekiel 12, Ezekiel digs through the wall of Jerusalem um, and packs all his belongings and puts them on his shoulder. Again, some would say, how stupid is that? Uh, he does it before everybody. But in fact, it was a parable of what was going to happen to all of them. They would go into exile with the walls broken down. And what's interesting, that's it toward the end of chapter 12 of Ezekiel. Guess how it begins in Ezekiel 12. Ezekiel, you live in the midst of a rebellious house who have eyes to see but do not see, ears to hear but do not hear. Just as in Isaiah 6, they're seen as not having... Uh, uh, spiritual eyes, they have physical eyes, physical ears but not spiritual ears, and then you get parables in the children. So again, you get the same language of having eyes but not seeing, ears but not hearing, and then you get the parable of Ezekiel digging through the wall. So the prophet's parables have a shock effect for genuine believers who become anesthetized because of living among other unspiritual people. There is a remnant, there's always a remnant in Israel. The parables are intended to have a jolting effect on this remnant who become complacent among the compromising majority. Israel didn't want to hear the truth and when it was presented straightforwardly to convict them of sin, they would not accept the fact of their sin. The parables function, however, to awake those who really do know the Lord. Now, we find in Ezekiel 3.27, I just want to, to compound the pattern. In Ezekiel 3.27, we find, he who hears, let him hear. Now that's the end of chapter 3. Chapter 4, verses 1 to 3, is the first parable. What does Ezekiel do? God says, take a brick, inscribe the name Jerusalem on it, and conduct siege works on it. It's kind of like a kid in a sand pile playing army. And he has these ramparts. He's to put an iron plate in front of the brick between him and, uh, and Ezekiel to show that they're going to be uh, oppressed and there's going to be uh, an army that will uh, uh, oppress them. Um, it's a parable again, but you get that language of spiritual anesthesia, uh, not having, uh, uh, having ears, but not spiritual ears, etc. So the parables of the prophets serve to judge intractably unrepentant people, but shock the faithful remnant out of their spiritually numb 
in lethargic condition. Now I'd like you to turn with me to Jesus as the prophet par excellence in Matthew 13. And not coincidentally, as we move to Matthew 13, we're going to see that Jesus quotes Isaiah 6, verses 9 to 13 that we just saw. Why would he do that? Because things haven't changed. The majority of the nation, again, are just as in Isaiah's generation, spiritually anesthetized. Jesus' parables are not a model. The main point of them is not to say, hey, use parables when you teach Sunday school so people can understand better. Now, illustrations may help if they're appropriate and practical, but that's not the point of this. In fact, parables in the prophets and with Jesus is raising the flag. Judgment is coming. Look with me at Matthew 13 then, beginning at verse 9. And Jesus has just told the uh, parable of the sower. Then he stops before he interprets it. And in verse 9, he who has ears, let him hear. That's interesting. Where does that come from? Isaiah 6, Ezekiel 3 that we looked at. And the disciples came to him and said, why do you speak to them in parables? It is because I want everyone in Israel to understand. No. No. In fact, they had rejected. They were intractable. This was now an act of judgment. Notice what he says, beginning in verse 11. He answered and said to them, To you it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. To the twelve, the, the remnant represented by the twelve as the beginning of the new tribes of Israel, the remnant. But then he says, But to them outside, to them it has not been given. For whoever, and that's the majority. For whoever has... To him more shall be given, and he shall have an abundance, but whoever does not have even what he has shall be taken away from him. Therefore I speak to them in parables. Why? Because of Isaiah 6. Because while seeing they do not see, while hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. In their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is being fulfilled. That word for fulfilled, there's a little different. It could be translated fulfilled again. It's not just fulfill. And he says, he quotes Isaiah, then it's being fulfilled. You'll keep on hearing, but will not understand. Keep on seeing, but will not perceive. For the heart of this people has become dull. And with their eyes, they scarcely hear. And they have closed their eyes, lest they should see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their heart, and turn again. And I should heal them. But now, notice, there's going to be judgment on the intractably unrepentant. But the disciples, they're going to understand. Verse 16, but blessed are your eyes because they see, your ears because they hear. And verse 17 said, many prophets hoped to see what you're seeing and hearing. So just as after Isaiah 6, so likewise Jesus speaks more parables and relates it to Isaiah 6 again. He quotes, he who has an ear, let him hear in verse 9. And then come a flurry of parables in the rest of the chapter, one after another, one after another. And it would be interesting to go through and explain how Israel misunderstood those parables. But that's for another occasion. Um, the purpose of his parables was to blind spiritually and deafen the majority of hearers. You have to realize it's Romans 1. When people are intractable in their idolatry, which is the case here, really, in Isaiah 6 and here, they were intractable here to tradition, which was dead and had become their idol. Jesus sometimes delivered his warnings the way the prophets did in a straightforward way, trying to convict his audience of sin and self-serving moral permissiveness, recalling them to the lessons of their history to learn from it, but they did not respond, and so he communicates this way with parables predominantly to raise the flag of judgment. They had become intractably hardened. Now, Actually, one thing I haven't mentioned, I do think there's always a remnant, even in the prophet's time and in Jesus' time, there's a small remnant who really are unbelievers, and they are shocked into the reality of their faith. There is that uh, remnant that's added to um, uh, the believing remnant. So the prophets and Jesus took up symbolic forms of warning, but such a warning form is effective only with the faithful. Now, did the disciples understand this? I was talking to someone uh, on the way to dinner about how much did the disciples understand? And Mark 8 
is absolutely intriguing. Uh, if you have your Bible, you can turn there because Mark 8 applies Isaiah 6 to the disciples. Now, Mark thir uh, Matthew 13 didn't do that. They applied it to the ones outside who were unbelieving, but the disciples were going to understand. But notice how Jesus applies Isaiah, uh, Isaiah 6 to the disciples, beginning in verse 16. He's just quoted a little bit earlier. Um, Isaiah chapter 6. And now in chapter 8 and verse 16, they began to discuss with one another the fact that they had no bread. And Jesus, aware of this, said, Why do you discuss the fact you have no bread? Do you not yet see or understand? See, so he had told them, Beware of the bread of the Sadducees and Pharisees. And they begin to talk about how, oh, they must be bad bakers. You know, we, we shouldn't eat that bread. Well, so it, he says, what he says here then, it makes sense, doesn't it? In verse 17, why? Uh, do you not yet see or understand? Do you have a hardened heart? Having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? But do you see what he's doing? Whereas in Matthew 13, he applies Isaiah 6 to the people who are unbelieving in a factual way. What's the difference here? The disciples are part of the hardened, anesthetized lump, but they're slowly but surely coming out of it. And that's why he poses the question. Do you not yet see? Do you not yet hear? And so they're coming out, but it's a process and they don't fully understand and, and fully therefore trust until uh, the time of the resurrection and even then they have some problems. It's not till the coming of the Spirit that it all seems to come fully into place. So they'd come under the influence of the spiritually hardened lump, and they're, but they're in the process of coming out. So with those who have ears to hear and hear not and have become irretrievably hard-hearted, symbolic language in parables is a judgment causing them to misunderstand further. Um, as with the prophets of old, Jesus' parables were a sign then that judgment had come upon the majority. Israel was being rejected as God's people. A new Israel was being raised up. And who is that? Jesus. Isaiah 49.3 speaks of Jesus as the servant. And uh, it's developed in chapter 53, the famous suffering servant passages. Isaiah 49.3 says, you are my servant Israel. He was the new Israel. And if you want to be part of Israel, whether Jew or Gentile, you attach yourself to Jesus. It's a Christological understanding of Israel. So symbolic parables enlighten the believer through shock but hardens the unbeliever. Now, I want to again observe that the hearing formulas in Matthew and Ezekiel and in, uh, uh, um, in Matthew, so Isaiah, Ezekiel, and Matthew, he who has an ear, that kind of language precedes the parables. You get the statement about having ears but not hearing, eyes not seeing, it's spiritual anesthesia. Then you get the parables to show that parables are given really as a judgment to such people. By the time Revelation is written, John stands at the end of Israel's very existence. As a nation, Israel's rejected Christ and his warnings of judgment. But how does this help us with the book of Revelation? Let's come to Revelation. At the end of each of the letters, you remember the famous phrase, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. That occurs seven times. And again, later in chapter 13. And it is an allusion back to Jesus' statement there in Matthew 13 and probably goes all the way back to what Jesus is alluding to in Isaiah and Ezekiel. Well, so what difference does that make? my wife would say. And by the way, that, that, that's not a demeaning statement for my wife. It's a demeaning statement on the fact I get so excited about Scripture, I forget to apply it sometimes. And sometimes in Old and the New, I say, isn't it exciting? This is from Daniel. And I leave it there. She says, what are you doing? Why don't you say what it means? So what's the significance of this in uh, the book of Revelation when we have this? Well, just as Jesus began speaking in symbolic language to Israel on earth, he continues to do so through John to the seven churches, who is the continuation of end time Israel. 
As in the Old Testament in Jesus' parables, the hearing formula of the letters. Now notice this, you get seven of them, and then what do you get? The symbolic portion in chapters 4 all the way to 22.5. Again, as in Isaiah and Ezekiel and in Matthew 13, you get the hearing formula, that is their spiritual anesthesia, and then you get the parables in the rest of the book. It's too coincidental. The same thing is going on, therefore, in the book of Revelation. In Jesus, in John's day, Israel had become like Pharaoh, who repeatedly received God's warning signs, but rejected them. Now the church, and this is sobering, the church in John's day, the continuation of Israel, had already become spiritually like Israel of old, or at least were in the same lethal danger. Remember, there are seven churches. There are only two faithful ones without an accusation by Jesus. Two, the first Ephesus and uh, the last Laodicea was on the verge of being judged as non-churches. The others weren't far behind. The point is, seven is the number of completeness. We know that. Seven spirits before the throne and one four. That's the fullness of the spirit. This is the church universal until Jesus comes back. And it is not in good shape. In the first century and apparently throughout the age, the remnant principle does not seem to stop when Jesus comes. And so, both in the Gospel of John and Revelation, is it coincidental that we get the plague signs from the Exodus? The trumpets, the seven trumpets and the seven bowls are modeled on the Exodus plagues. Why? Because the church is in the position to a certain significant degree of Israel. I thought all of this was for unbelievers, to punish unbelievers, and that's true in the book of Revelation. But... It's also for those in the church who think they're believers, but they're really pseudo-believers. And we'll look at that in just a moment. So the reason that the prophets, Jesus and John, use symbols is so that Israel and the continuation of Israel and we should perceive spiritual reality and not merely listen to abstractions about it. So we may make the following deduction, which forms the next major heading and point of this message. And that is, revelation symbols either sedate or shock us back into the reality of our relation with God. They either sedate us about our relationship with God and we can become anesthetized, or it shocks us into the reality of our relation with God. This is the main point of the repeated phrase, he who has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. <clears throat> now there it's turned around a little positively. It's now focusing on the remnant. But all those who don't respond, of course, are those who don't have ears and eyes. This word for parable or symbol uh, in Hebrew and Aramaic means comparison. The idea is you look at the comparison, you look at the symbol or parable and you compare it to yourself to learn from it. You could almost say it's application. People look at the picture and apply it to their lives. It can cause us to look at the truth and reality in a different way to shock us into the reality of our sin. We want to rationalize sin away. As we look at these images, it's hard to do that. This is what happened when David sinned by committing adultery with Bathsheba. Notice 2 Samuel 12. Nathan comes to David in 2 Samuel chapter 12. And this is, of course, after he had murdered Uriah and had committed adultery with Bathsheba. And Nathan comes to him, and he does not state straightforwardly, David, you murdered, you committed adultery, shame on you. And David probably would have killed him. Um, but that's not what happened. Nathan goes and tells a parable to David. And I think David knows it's a parable. He says, in 2 Samuel 12, 1, there were two men in one city, the one rich, the other poor. The rich man had a great many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb which he bought and nourished. And it grew up together with him and his children. It would eat his bread and drink of his cup and lie in his bosom. It was like a daughter to him now, a traveler came to the rich man. He was unwilling to take from his own flock or his own herd to prepare for the wayfarer who had come to him. Rather, he took the poor man's ewe lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Then David's anger burned greatly against the man. Uh, and he said to David, as the Lord lives, surely the man who has done this deserves to die. Then he lessens the punishment in verse 6. He must make restitution for the lamb fourfold. 
And see, David thinking, well, this isn't me. This is someone else. And boy, he leashes out with a judgment then. And then Nathan comes down with a hammer. You're the man. And at that, David's heart was pierced. Notice uh, what he says in um, what Nathan says. Verse 7, you are the man. And it's really God speaking through Nathan. You see, looking at the parable, we look at them, we try to understand what they mean from the Old Testament and elsewhere. But then we have to say, how does this relate to us? Now, we're going to see a lot of these symbols are to convict us of our sin, but there are some also, of course, that will encourage us. So these symbols are there to afflict the comfortable, of course, and yet to comfort the afflicted. Now, David is a good example then of the way these symbols work. What are some areas of our lives to which we're spiritually insensitive? Extreme poverty and suffering exist even in our own country, but sometimes we don't think of it because for one reason or another we don't see it. And uh, perhaps more of our churches should become aware of this situation because when we begin to see pictures, we take action. In Hitler's Germany, many knew about the concentration camps, but perhaps one of the reasons they did not register as much objection was because they really didn't see what was going on. Perhaps that's one of the reasons. When you see pictures, it changes one, as it is in the book of Revelation. What are some of the areas of our lives to which we are spiritually insensitive? Maybe it's a wrong relationship. Maybe it's a perennial lie. Maybe it's a theft. Maybe husbands and wives are complacent about nourishing one another and their children with God's word. Perhaps parents are so busy they don't have much time to talk about not only their lives and the day as it went by, but God's word. Pastors may be so busy doing everything except perhaps preparing the scriptures for their message or messages on Sunday. And when that doesn't happen, they don't nourish God's flock, and they provide the fertile ground for false teaching to arise. Revelation symbols either sedate or shock us back into the reality of our relation with God. Will we be spiritually sedated, like Israel and some in the church in the first century, or shocked into repentance? I want to show you one stirring example of the shock treatment. I'd like you to turn to Revelation 2. Revelation 2. In Revelation 2, in the church of Thyatira, beginning at verse 20, it says this, I have this against you. Revelation 2, 20. Jesus says, I have this against you. You, you. you tolerate the woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess, and she teaches and leads my bondservants astray so that they commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her time to repent. She does not want to repent of her immorality. Behold, I'll cast her upon a bed of sickness, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of her deeds. In verse 24, he says, But I say to you, the rest who are in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, that is of Jezebel, who have not known the deep things of Satan, as they call them, I place no other burden on you. Now, what was going on there? It seems kind of, how could any church, how could any uh, uh, elders in, in a church allow a false teacher to allow immorality and, and encourage it? Well, I think what's going on here is you look at that word commit immorality elsewhere in the book, it's not literal sexual immorality, it is spiritual immorality, and that is trusting in idols, even in the world system, having spiritual uh, uh, intercourse with the world system. And what Jezebel was saying was, um, you see, in the, in, the, in the early church in most of the cities, th there were many trades, and each trade, whether it's silversmiths or it's sheep dealing in woolen goods, every trade had its patron deities. And you had to go at least once a year to the local temple of the patron deity or goddess uh, to show that you're supporting uh, that deity who prospered your trade in the preceding year, uh, eating a meal dedicated to that... Um, uh, deity. And if you didn't do that, you'd be ostracized. So Christians are in a tough spot. What are they going to do? Jezebel said, I have the idea. You go in there. These are the deep things of Satan that are happening there. You need to find out how the devil is working. 
and come back and tell everybody else. Maybe that was one of the rationalizations. We, there may have been others. It may be like people who go to a football game and sing the national anthem and they don't really mean it. She said, I go in and, you know, uh, when they're praying, you know, you pray to the Lord, you know, and them, they, they won't trouble you. And so what, whatever it was, she was teaching a compromise that uh, would lethally dilute their witness for when they're out uh, in, in, in the city uh, saying Jesus is the only way and uh, other pagans who had been at the temple ceremonies would say, yeah, mm-hmm, sure. And so she's teaching something very lethal here. But you can see the rationalization. It's very interesting. So the Thyatirans tolerated her teaching. They may have disagreed with it, but said, look, a little liberty of conscience here. We're disagreeing a little bit. John wants to sh shock the sluggish Christians so that they will discern the gravity of the situation. Later in Revelation 17, he paints Jezebel in her true colors. I'd like you to turn there now with me. Revelation 17. How does he do that? Notice that in Revelation 17, as I mentioned at the beginning of this message, this is a, a, a big vision of Babylon the Great. Remember the end of, of verse 1? He's, he's going to be uh, showing about the great harlot who sits on many waters. Verse 2, with whom the kings of the earth committed acts of immorality. Those who dwell on the earth were made drunk with the wine of her immorality. And so, notice, as you read through this chapter, which we don't have time to do, but I'll point out a few things, Babylon the Great is painted according to illusions about Jezebel in the Old Testament, who was married to Ahab. For example, if you look at chapter 17 of verse 16, and the ten horns which you saw on the beast, these will hate the harlot and make her desolate and naked and will eat her flesh. Well. Uh, 2 Kings 9, 36, they will eat the flesh of Jezebel. And likewise, at the very end, in verse 17, it says these, uh, this destruction of Babylon would happen until the words of God should be fulfilled. And so 2 Kings 9, 36 says, this is according to the word of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. In fact, both uh, uh, Jezebel in Thyatira and Jezebel in the Old Testament were prose at being syncretists. That is, uh, Jezebel in the Old Testament said, I want Baal worship. It doesn't mean necessarily you have to reject Yahweh, but you've got to worship Baal as well. And so Jezebel is doing something similar. In my commentary, I give a number of ways that, uh, in fact, I have 11 other parallels between Jezebel and Thyatira and, and Babylon the Great, actually, in chapter 17 and uh, Jezebel in the Old Testament. They both seduce people, they deceived by sorceries, they persecuted and killed the saints, on and on. Who is Babylon? Babylon is the entire corrupt economic, religious, and social system. But it includes apostate Israel and the apostate sector of the church. Though past commentators have tended to identify Babylon only with the ungodly Roman culture, and that's part of it, of course, but I think it's all of those that I just mentioned. And what is this text saying then? Jezebel and Thyatira <clears throat> is a fifth columnist movement. That is, it's, it's, it's Babylon the Great coming into the church using theological language that's been diluted and is actually communicating the ideas of the world. So Jezebel and Thyatira is none other than Babylon the Great riding on the whore, going down the center aisle of the church, of course, which they didn't have in house churches, but I speak figuratively. Um, <laughs> perhaps appropriately so. Now, in chapter 17, I want you to notice, <clears throat> beginning at verse... Six, I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints, with the blood of the witnesses of Jesus, and when I saw her, I wondered greatly. And the angel said to me, why do you wonder? He was, he was amazed. He was astonished. This actually is an allusion back to Daniel telling Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 4 that he was like a tree that would be cut down. And then it says about Daniel, he was appalled. His thoughts troubled him. And so with John, he expresses fear about this nightmarish vision he's just seen concerning the horrible nature of the beast and the woman. He's troubled. But that's not all. Very intriguing. Contributory to, this, to John's shock may have been 
the parabolic portrayal of Babylon in the guise of a religiously faithful figure. How is that? Look with me at chapter 17 and verse 4. The woman was clothed in purple and scarlet, adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. And chapter 18 and verse 16 says she was clothed in fine linen, purple and scarlet. That is the identical language to describe the bride of Christ in chapter 21, 18 to 21. And in 19.8, it says that the bride of Christ uh, is dressed in fine linen, which are the uh, uh, just works of the righteous, the righteous deeds of the saints. On the other hand, the beast is full of blasphemous names. The cup in the woman's hand is full of abominations, the unclean things of her immorality. She's got blood on her from the saints, called the mother of harlots, abominations of the earth, drunk from the blood of the saints. What's going on? You talk about dissonance. <clears throat> in fact, this language of the clothing of the woman in chapter 17, verse 4, also goes back to the clothing of the high priest, according to Exodus 25. 5 through 12. So John, in his initial experience of the vision perhaps, maybe even like the leaders in Thyatira with regard to Jezebel, may have been temporarily captivated. Hey, th th this is a good person. I don't know about you, but it's often that false teachers, whether in universities or elsewhere, they're witty, they're excellent, they're charismatic, but their message is lethal. Maybe something like that's going on. Part of the depiction of the Babylonian woman is taken from the Old Testament portrayal of Jezebel then. Since Jezebel was a leader who stood for the model of a party of false teachers in Revelation, the point here in our text would be that even John may have been shocked to discover that the Jezebel party was passing itself off as a group of Christian teachers. And they're none other than pseudo-Christian false teachers. And he wants the elders in Thyatira to know that. This is not just a matter of conscience. He's drawing back the apocalyptic curtains and through symbolism, he is trying to shock them into the reality of the sin they have become habitually comfortable with. So as long as the church of Thyatira allows Jezebel to teach such things, then the church is going to be having a very close communion with the devil himself. And a whole flood of spiritual evil will come, as Revelation 12, 15 talks about the flood coming from the serpent's mouth. They need to be shocked like John. He who has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. John is saying to us that Revelation symbols either sedate or shock us back into the reality of our relation with God. Is there a sinful area in our lives that we don't think is really that bad? Will we be sedated or shocked about it? Sometimes on the way to church, I see people jogging. Now, some of them may have gone to the early or the late service, whatever, but some probably don't go to church, and they're comfortable. They need to be shocked into their faith for the first time. So the reason that John uses symbols, this is a conclusion, is so that we should actually see and perceive spiritual reality, not merely listen to abstractions about it, and be shocked out of our sinful habit patterns. Pictures worth a thousand words. You may have... At one point in your life, heard about Nagasaki and Hiroshima and the atom bomb there, but then you saw pictures. It made a different impression. That's the way it is in the book of Revelation. It's the same in our spiritual lives. I remember some years ago that I made an appointment with an oral hygienist to check and clean my teeth. I hadn't gone in a while, and while sitting in the dental chair during a two-minute break in the procedure, right next to me were these pictures of the progression of gum disease going from good to the worst. Of course, I became enthralled with this. It was right in my face, about a foot away. And as when she came in, I said, where am I on the chart? She said, well, you're really edging toward the rotten gum part. And I said, my gums feel fine. She said, that's the genius of gum disease, that uh, you feel fine until it's too late. You see, my gums, the, the ears of my gums were not hearing. The eyes of my gums were not seeing. <laughs> How do you like that for mixed metaphors? But again, maybe that's appropriate. Some of these metaphors in Revelation are amazing. Um, sometimes sin is like gum disease. We may not feel the spiritual hurt until significant harm has happened. We need the parabolic pictures of Revelation to shock us into the reality of our sin, spark us back into a healthy relation with God. 
Those within the covenant community, the Asia Minor churches, needed to have ears to hear. Will we, be, will we be sedated or shocked? Jesus Christ has come. He's died for sin. He's risen again as the Lord God of heaven and earth, demonstrating himself to be, and as God demonstrated him to be, according to Romans 1, 3, and 4. <sighs> the gospel's never too old for us. One of the ways to become shocked about our sin is to remember what Christ has done for us. And can we be so ungrateful for he who died for our sin to become habitually comfortable with it? I pray not. Perhaps we're, some people uh, think they're believers and they're not. They need to be shocked into their faith for the first time. Others are believers, but they, they need to look at these images and to be shocked by them. Of course, the Bible itself does that in other parts. It, the Spirit will work through it to bring us into conformity with God's Son. Now, others in the church may have their ears very attuned to God's voice in Scripture and accordingly respond by both desiring to obey God's Word and by actually obeying it, and they receive assurance and comfort from these pictures. Some are positive pictures, by the way. Revelation 21 climaxes with an amazing picture of the new heavens and earth on into the beginning of chapter 22. May such people continue to be given grace to hear God's voice, not merely in their physical, but also their spiritual ears and do God's word. For after all, remember, while my message has been a little bit on the negative side about being convicted about sin, remember chapter 1 and verse 3. It says, blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and keep the things which are written in it, for the time is near. May God give us grace so that if we have ears, we'll hear what his symbols are saying to us. Let's pray. Father, I do pray you'll give us eyes to see.